thank you for doing this interview. You know that I've been a fan of your work for a very long time, and I finally managed to convince you to do an interview with me. It's taken 17 years and six weeks. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having me, Stephen. Um, so if you could do a poster for any band, any TV series, any movie, you don't have to worry about likeness rights. You don't have to worry about the rights. You just get to do it. What's the thing that you would love to do? Yeah, what's the thing? Um, there's a lot of them nowadays. I mean, early on, I wouldn't have expected uh, to run into these issues, but now things like Escape from New York, uh, Predator, Commando, you, you realize uh, how many likenesses are involved and, and they're just really impossible. So then, of course, the more the harder it is to do them, the more you're like, man, I really wish I could do Escape from New York with all the likenesses because that's really hard right now. I know that you can do them with Snake's likeness, but um, so those are kind of the, the great white whales that uh, would be a lot of fun to do. And uh, TV shows, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I completely get it. Um, I think for fans of you for your of your work, I think they're curious. How long does it actually take you to do a poster? Could you sort of talk about a time frame? So I come from doing like gig posters, and a lot of the times early on, it was just like you have a week to do this, and so or less, two days. We need a poster, and so that was always kind of the driving force behind how I started my um, process was just deadlines, and so in the early days of doing stuff for like Mondo and stuff, we would do like, you know, like Iron Man 2 would be done like in a week. And, uh, and because they were just like, we need it. And so you have to do it right now. And, and that was a lot of fun. And nowadays people are more like, you can take as long as you want, which really means that I start working on all these other projects between then. So I have, you know, people that are hitting me up for different things. You know, I'm doing stuff for friends that are like stickers or shirts or whatever. And so then you're just putting off a poster, putting off a poster um, like uh, Mad Max Fury Road. We're, we're working on that for a screening for, uh, um, yeah, Ken Harmon, I'm forgetting. <laughs> uh, he just emailed me. They're down in California. Not Wait, I, didn't, I didn't even know that. Did I know that you were doing a Mad Max Fury Road poster? Yeah, I'm not sure. It was it was announced right before the COVID thing. And then they were like, this, the Roxy was going to do a screening with Spoke Art, obviously. And uh, Ken at Spoke Art, it was very exciting. And we were like a, a month away from it's happening now. I mean, people were they were selling like screening tickets and stuff. And then um, they, the Roxy obviously had to shut everything down, which was a huge bummer. And so then they just postponed it. And now they're, you know, there's rumblings that it's starting up again. And so anyway, all that to say is that when it was happening, I was like, all right, this is 100% what I'm working on, you know, on 50%, 60%. And then all of a sudden, like, we're postponing it. So then you just kind of like, well, I guess I'll move on to something else. And so I have what I like. It's a, it's a fun poster, but I need to get back. And now they're like, okay, now there's a deadline again. So um, it really, deadlines are huge. I mean, like Star Wars, when I did those, it was like a month per poster because they were like, take as much as you want in time. So then you're just doing it over and over and over and making it the best thing it can be. Um, whereas like uh, The Thing or those early on posters, it was usually like a couple weeks. And so. It's so much, it's, yeah, it's so interesting. Now I also would like to see, um, I think secretly you should be showing us a work in progress of yeah. Mad Max Fury Road on camera right now, because I know it's right next to you. Yeah, and you right should, here. Right, exactly. It's amazing. <laughs> um, what uh, what's the fastest poster that you've done and which is the one that took the longest? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think with Fury Era, I don't know if you that uh, Iron Man 2, which I mentioned, that probably was kind of the biggest turn and burn type thing. Um, I know Akira was one of the biggest, fastest print jobs we ever did. I think the screening was like on a Friday or Saturday and I turned the files into our printer like on a, Wednesday or Thursday, it was crazy. He like printed it all one day and then next day it. And so that was a big turnaround. And then the longest, uh, well, <laughs> uh, let's see, Captain America Civil War took over a year to get approved. So I'd done it and then they're like, oh, we're running into some rights issues. And it actually took a year to get it completely approved, over a year. And so that was a huge like, 
eye opener for me as a uh, as a freelancer that does this supposedly for a living, I guess, um, to be like, all right, I just did a job. And they'll be like, OK, we'll pay you in a year. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was fine. It worked out great. Um, but it was just, uh, it, it really helped. It made me think I need to do little things like these, like sticker sales and other like, uh, um, side projects that kind of bring in re revenue while we're waiting for approvals. So. What do you do with your original drawings? So my posters are usually pretty big and collagey. And so there isn't necessarily, and I won't say necessarily, there isn't a big master sheet usually of just one poster that has everything on it. So it's all sketchbooks and sketch pads and some of it's even digital stuff nowadays. Um, so I need to really, cause I'm like, Sarah's like, oh, you should put out a book. And so I'm like, I need to track down and, uh, and really put this stuff all together. But right now it's just all over the place. I, I've given some stuff away. I don't really like to sell it just because I might eventually do a book. And so then you're like holding on to it and I'm probably a little bit of a hoarder that way. Um, but yeah, so I don't really do anything with them. <laughs> I was going to say there, there is obviously a huge market for originals. And yeah. I was going to say that like, and I, again, I don't really know how long it takes, but let me use Shaun of the Dead, for example. Yeah. If, yeah. if you, if you had, the, if you made a Shaun of the Dead and you hand did it and said, this is my sketch right. you know, for Shaun, that, that's a lot of money. Right. Yeah, it definitely would be. It just is really hard for me to go back and uh, and revisit things and be like, it's done. It's perfect as it is. Of course, I'll go I'll go back and like mine it for sticker ideas and stuff. So I guess I'm a bit of a hypocrite, but um, I need to get better at that stuff or train my kids to do it. Just be like, all right, kids, you know, let's put this all together and start drawing and do a little factory. But uh, yeah, I don't really take advantage of things as much as I should. So. Um, Hopefully my yeah. wife doesn't watch this video. She's going to get all these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, jumping into actually uh, why I get to talk to you. So you are doing the Halloween poster, which is the main reason why we're talking. Um, talk a little bit about where this, this whole thing came from. And is there any, because Halloween is one of those properties that a number of people have tackled. Is there more pressure? You put more pressure on yourself on that kind of a poster where other artists have interpreted it? Um, or is it sort of like, um, you know, or is it just another poster? Yeah, that's a good question. I, it, it, it came about with uh, Mike from Gray Matter, who I've known for a long time. He said, hey, we have the rights to this. And I'm a huge uh, John Carpenter. He's probably kind of my perfect director. Uh, a certain body of his work is just like everything was a hit. I mean, my goal is kind of like uh, to do everything that I really like of his. So I don't know if we'll be doing like Invisible Man, but uh, making our way through a select portion of his filmography. And so last Halloween, I was like, okay, we're going to do that. And then things just didn't work out. And so now I'm catching up on last Halloween's project, <laughs> which is why we have a Halloween poster coming out in uh, April. So, <laughs> Really? The um, do you usually prefer the regular edition or the variant? On posters, I, uh, I always try to prefer or put my favorite as the regular edition just because it's the one that gets printed the most. And uh, it would kind of drive uh, me personally crazy if uh, I was printing the most of uh, not an inferior, but my lesser favorite one. So it's like, oh, unless you're really printing a ton of metallics and being like, this is the best, but it's just not affordable. So that's why it's a variant. But most of the time, I try to make the regular kind of the best, at least my favorite. And then the variant is something that kind of, especially with my variants having a lot of gold metallics, they have kind of become a little bit of a series of their own. So it's like gold metallics and silvers and grays. And you could put them all up and a lot of them would really go together. And so then that becomes its own thing. But as a whole, I don't look at any one variant and say, that one, you know, is my favorite over the regular. Well, over time, there will be ones I look back at, like when we did uh, the first Avengers poster. I really liked the regular and then the variant was a little more monochromatic uh, grays and reds and over time i actually much prefer that variant because i think it just looks cooler and the the, the regular has you know uh, too many colors in my opinion so um that just really it changes over time but i try to pick the best one as being the regular edition and the variant becomes is it's just kind of a second like this is your second choice kind of thing i i, I really like your uh, halloween poster but I will say that I really, I, I think the regular is my favorite. The, the, awesome. the use of the use of orange is just really cool. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, that's what I think too. The gold is cool because it's part of my, you know, variants of all having gold. 
but obviously orange is like you know orange pumpkins orange halloween so i think that's uh that was a lot of fun just to color that one so uh you recently did a terminator poster and yeah. you you did a timed edition on it yeah. when you did that honestly what were you like really hoping to sell versus how many you actually sold uh, I was hoping to sell a thousand, which is, you know, still uh, big numbers for me because most of my runs are usually like 700 um, for a regular edition. And so a thousand would be cool. Um, and that's why we didn't do it for a huge window. We didn't be like, here, it's free selling for a week because then we were worried. I mean, it's just that Sarah and I are the ones kind of running the show here. And so we didn't want to be shipping more than we could handle. And so it actually was more than a thousand, but it still worked out. It was stressful, I guess. But yeah, it was, it was, it was a surprise. It was a surprise. I would imagine that there is an element of this is amazing. I can't believe we sold this many. And then at the same time, you're like, oh my God, this is going to be a ton of work to ship. Right. Right. Yeah. It was, uh, it was ridiculous. We were shipping for like two months or something. And my wife is hiring all of my daughter who's 16, all of her friends. So they were coming and there was this huge packing and they were just looking at me like, what do you do for a living? You know, here's a movie we've never seen and we're folding it up. And Sarah's like, you, you, you know, she wasn't having them roll anything, of course, because just, you know, it, it's actually kind of a little bit of an art to roll a poster. And so she had to do all the, the rolling or I did. And so it, it was a it was an experience. I don't know if we'll be doing it, you know, monthly, but. <laughs> right. That's actually something I wanted to ask you about. You you're a very popular poster artist. And I'm curious if you, in, in your mind, in talking to Sarah, are you leaning towards in the future wanting to do more timed editions so more people can actually get your poster? Because I think one of the issues is when you release certain things, they sell out very quickly. And what's that line of, okay, let's do a timed edition so more people can get it versus, you know, we're only going to make 600 or 800 or 500. Yeah, it's. I mean, as you said, that time one was our first one, and I think it was it was kind of an experiment to see how it went, and there were certain aspects of it we really enjoyed, and certain aspects that you kind of miss the old ways of being like, this is a fun event that's more limited. Um, it still ended up being, I guess, somewhat limited. I mean, there is a, a finite number of that edition, but it's just bigger, and you don't you just don't want to make things, you don't want to give the impression you're just kind of churning stuff out to, to meet I mean, just to have it just be such a huge thing. You don't want to take advantage of a, of a collector base and just be like, we're really going to try to, to fleece people or anything. So there's a bunch of variant uh, variables that we kind of try to try to think about. It's just like your kind of gut feeling, like I feel good about this. And so I feel like if you do one time to edition a, a year, then um, the other stuff, you kind of do your own thing with the, the regular, going back to the regular edition type stuff. But whether or not we do more than one movie poster a year, I don't know. I mean, it would be fun. It's just um, making it work out. So this year we might do two, I guess, if Mad Max Fury Road and Halloween works out. And then who knows, maybe we'll, we'll really do a bunch. But Have you guys ever talked about, and I don't know if this is possible or not, but for some of your older posters, has there ever been a discussion of like um, doing another variant of an older poster uh, for whatever reason. So it's like, you know, um, you know making like a, a third variant or doing something like that, or does that sort of never come up? Yeah, well, um, so like reprinting something you might say? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've been doing gig posters now for, all, I guess, over 20 years, which is, you know, looking at me, you wouldn't know it. You'd think I was 15, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, I, there, there's a lot of taboos in the poster world and reprints used to be a big one of them. Um, and I don't know if it is anymore. I, maybe people are doing it, but it used to be like, you just made something that you considered part of you know, your work and you didn't go back and touch it. You tried not to go back and mess with it. And again, with stickers, I'll sometimes do a pull an element from an older poster and do is it a sticker or something. But uh, re reprinting an entire poster, it's almost like you feel like you have to get permission from every single person who bought that first run and make sure they were okay with it because it used to be, and again, I don't know if it still is, you're kind of lowering the um, collectability of posters that they've really cherished. Not that we're all about, you know, things going up in value and all that sort of stuff, 
but you have to respect the fact that some of these people paid money for these on the secondary market and you don't want to be like, now here's a third variant. And then they're like, oh, and now here's a fourth and it's not that much different colors and stuff. So that, that's something we do consider. And also, of course, a lot of these, uh, we would run into rights issues where I couldn't reprint anything that I'd done for Mondo as a poster without going back to Mondo and say, hey, let's work something out. And I think that might kind of go against their credo of reprinting older stuff as well. So it would be it would be a lot of work just to make sure nobody's feelings got hurt or uh, you weren't kind of doing something that seemed gross. I mean, if I was like dead or on my deathbed and they're like, let's do a fundraiser. So let's raise, you know, do a reprint of the thing. Then people would probably like rally together and they'd show a picture of me in the hospital. Like, oh, thank you. <laughs> but uh, probably until then, we probably won't be doing too many reprints. I mean, I don't know. So I don't, I don't think so. We don't have any plans just because it would be pretty, uh, it's pretty taboo, I guess. No, I, I completely get it. I was just curious. Um, yeah. One of the things is that uh, there was a little bit of a phase where there was a lot of metal posters being done. Yeah. And you have released a number of metal posters, but it seems like in the last year or two, I don't know the exact time frame, yeah. that no yeah. one's really doing metal posters anymore. And is it um, is there a reason for this? What were your thoughts on metal posters? Because I I have one of your metal posters on my wall, the drive poster. Yeah. And it's fucking cool. Yeah. So, you know, like I sort of, I'm saying this is like a fan, like I kind of want more, uh, even though they're really hard to get. And so anyway, I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. It's, I mean, there's a bunch of factors. I know, um, like you had discussed yesterday, uh, just on the phone, we talked about, you mentioned you probably thought one of the reasons is, is just our people buying them as much and it, it does cost a lot. So like a regular post might be 65 bucks, a metal poster might be 350 or something crazy. Um, I think another factor is just uh, the screen print shop that printed a lot of them, DNL. Like I was talking to Steve, the guy who ran that, and he said, um, like, it's like printing kind of like a stop sign where you're using pretty different inks than post drinks and a lot of that stuff can get really toxic. So they're all wearing like breathers and doing stuff that's a lot uh, heavier duty than just poster ink. So they want, they're like, we really have to shut down the shop when we're printing metal posters because it's such a, it, it is a big deal. It's a big process. And so that would be a trick, just making sure you were printing it in a safe way that we didn't know about, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And then it comes out that a lot of this stuff is a little more, um, I mean, I don't think they're bad to own because I own like, I own a lot of my metal posters and hopefully you're not breathing in like stuff now, but I think it's just the printing process. Like, I know it's obviously not water-based ink, so it's more oil-based ink, and you're just breathing in some stuff that makes these uh, metal posters just, they're, they're, they're more work to print than a regular one. What about, like, wood additions? Because, for example, like, you know, you have the Django uh, Unchained. Um, there's been a number of wood posters that people have done. Are those easier to make? I think so, yeah. I would definitely assume you could use water-based ink on those, and I think those would be a lot easier. So that probably just comes down to collectability like are people really interested in wood posters and and even with metal you have to think well where um is there an angle like a terminator poster would have been a perfect poster to do metal on obviously and that one um we were just like eh, we'll do kind of a metal paper for the variant but we didn't do a metal poster um but in django was perfect on wood i think just because it was from that era so with halloween you're kind of like well what is the angle to print it on a metal or a wood you know, is there a connection? And I don't think we, we didn't consider those type of um, materials to print on for Halloween just because we were like, there isn't really anything other than paper, you know, paper bags for candy and stuff like that. So <laughs> when you make a poster, how many do you typically save for yourself? I've noticed over the years, you do a lot of cool things for charity. You're raising money for really great causes, which I just want to say thank you for doing that. But it's like amazing to me to be like, OK, so all of a sudden out of the blue, there's a Kill Bill poster or there is a, you know, you whip out something that's older to raise money. Again, awesome. But yeah. it's like there's only so many of these you can probably have in right. your collection. So I'm just curious, how many do you typically save of the things you make? And do you still have like more than one Robocop poster left? Or are you just like you just have one? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think. um Early on, I didn't realize these things would be at all collectible. So like Lost Boys, I did that one and I kept one poster. 
And so for many years, I'm like, this is my Lost Boys poster, and it's one poster in the file. And of course, it goes back into the flat file, and I put other posters, and it gets all smashed. And so I have one smashed Lost Boys poster. <laughs> um, and then later on, somebody else felt sorry for me. It was like, you only have one. So then they sent me another one, which was really nice. I think I might have traded for, I can't remember. But anyway, so now I have two Lost Ones posters. <laughs> but other ones, um, since then, I've been like, okay, I need to keep more of these. So then early on, which now we probably, maybe it's a good idea because I have like 50,000 flat files in here. Um, we started keeping 10 of the regulars, 10 of the APs, 10 of the regular variants, and 10 of those. So it's 20 of each poster. And so it's a good amount, especially since I got a ton of kids um, that are supposedly going to potentially want one of these. I'm sure they won't. You're like, every one of my child children will want every single one of my posters. So I'm like, they're not going to. They're going to be like, out of all the thousands of posters you've done, we're going to want like one. So, <laughs> But that's where they come from is I usually just try to keep 10 and 10. And a lot of times with posters, it's like you have your big sale. So like with Terminator, and then we're going to sell them. We're shipping them, shipping. And then at the end, you might be like, okay, we kept X amount back for damages. And so we have those, the last 10 or 15 or whatever, and you're going to have those and sell them once things quiet down in case there aren't, I think if people say I have a damage, then they're like, okay, ship it back or destroy it. We'll ship your replacement. But if you still have some at the end of that whole run, then you're like, oh, I can sell these now. But at the same time, you, you've moved on to other things. And so you're just having them in flat files. And so then you have stacks of these weird posters where you're having, this is where all my Terminator posters. And then you open another flat file and you're like, oh, here's more flat file. Here's more Terminator posters, you know. So then you kind of are, I can, let's see if I can turn my camera around. Screw it up. But let's see. So you can see my flat files. And let's see. Those flat files right there. And then I have two rows back there. So anyway. You, you, have, one or, you have one or two flat files. I do. Yeah, yeah. I used to have kind of an addiction uh, of collecting fat, flat files on Craigslist. But now I switch to cigarettes. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's going to be like, wait, what? <laughs> like, so, for example, like, for like a big trouble in Little China variant, there's like 35 or 40 of those. Do you still have 10 variants? Or do you still have like, do so you have like one or two of those posters? Yes, that would be from the early era of like, oh, why keep them if you can sell them for $40 back in the day? And so that's what we did. We just sold them. So a lot of those, Blade Runners, uh, The Thing... Big Trouble Little China, RoboCop, you're keeping maybe five. And so I did sell a RoboCop, I think this last year for something or two years ago. And it was a big deal because you're like, I don't have, I have like five of these. And I have more than five kids. So uh, <laughs> it's going to be an issue. Uh, if, if every one of them wants it, they're going to be going on eBay or something. But then Sarah was like, realistically, your kids aren't going to want a RoboCop poster. So. That was a nice, uh, a nice reminder. <laughs> the, the one, the one thing that I've always wanted and I've never gotten uh, because of the price, uh, the RoboCop medal, which is one of those posters that f, I, I, you know what I mean. So yeah. do you, so you have one of those or do you have multiples? If I have more than one, it would be two, but I certainly don't have more than two. I mean, again. So it's like your metal posters, and then you put a piece of paper, metal poster, piece of paper, and then uh, your say drive comes in and you're like where do I keep these oh I'll keep them in the metal poster drawer and so then you put them on and these things weigh like considerable so to get to my older ones like those you're like all right let me just pull my back you know so I would guess that I have probably one I mean I one or two of, of that RoboCop one just because it's so far under there I need to I mean we're eventually probably going to move from this place and that's when you'll like find all these old old prints but yeah Definitely not enough that you could feel comfortable selling it. You're, a lot of that stuff, you're kind of like, well, I could sell this poster for whatever it was going for. I don't know, $1,000 or something. And then later on, or you can be like, or I could do the, the same amount of work on just working on like an art print and make that $1,000 on that. And so you're kind of like, I'll just do that instead. It's, it's easier and it's something new. I try not to give the impression too much of like kind of resting on my laurels and and selling older stuff but occasionally like a couple years ago our dog needed like a ton of veterinary bill stuff so then i was like okay i gotta sell a bunch of stuff because we immediately need this money so then we just did that and so you try to kind of have a good balance of putting out new stuff and making your money off that and letting the old stuff just kind of live its own life and then occasionally dipping into the old stuff 
if you're trying to cover your your ill-placed bets. <laughs> I I completely get that. Um, recently, a um, Justin used to be with Mondo, sold off some of his collection, and one of which was a Kill Bill medal, which yeah. which is a very rare uh, medal edition. Are there a few like really rare items that you have that people might not even believe are sort of in the ether? Like the Kill Bill medal, I had never seen before yeah. um, when that went up. So are there other like metal editions of some posters that we do not know about as fans? I don't think so, unless they're printing stuff. I mean, there's always weird things where I have some Guardians of the Galaxy stuff that's on different paper with different colors. That's kind of like, oh, what about this paper with this? And then we're kind of like, no, no, that during the printing process, those would be kind of like uh, test print type stuff, but nothing that would be to the, uh, the amount of work that would take to make a metal one it would have to be a real, like that would be a lot of money that they would spend to print it. And they usually only spend money if they can make that back through at least publicity like that Kill Bill uh, medal where they're presenting it to Tarantino and, uh, and they kind of get their value that they put into printing it out of it that way by saying, here's a cool thing we printed even though we're not selling any. So nothing that I know of in terms of metal. Um, yeah, I can't think of any. I have a big Avengers Age of Ultron on metal that I think they printed a couple of those. And that was a different printing process. So it wasn't screen printed. And uh, that thing, again, I don't know if you can let's see, if you can turn my camera. So it's that guy right there. It's pretty big. So it's, it's oversized and it's pretty cool. But I guess they just made two of them. That was Hero Complex. And uh, so that was fun. But they didn't make any of those to sell, I don't think, unless they sold their copy. I don't know. <laughs> Um, do you, one of the things I find interesting about the poster market or the poster uh, in posters in general is there seems to be like a lot of people are making, and not to criticize Halloween because I'm super happy you made it, but a lot of people make a Halloween poster. Right. Um, but like there's not a lot of Orson Welles posters or Kubrick posters or the list goes on and on. Like there's no Caddyshack poster. I mean, I could give you a list of so many great movies that have never had a poster. Is there some reason for this, or is is it just you know the rights issues? Like, why is it that certain movies have just never been done? Yeah, I think some of the the reasons you mentioned are, are perfect example reasons, like the rights issues. And then I think a lot of times we just get stuck in this kind of uh, I don't want to say rut, but it's like everybody's doing their uh, Escape from New York poster, everybody's doing their Halloween poster, everybody's doing those things that we just kind of keep going back to that well and saying, I really like this poster. There's an audience because we sold a bunch. And so, but I, I totally agree. I think we should be expanding it and being like, well, let's make a deep impact poster, you know, let's start. To <laughs> oh, I'm going to stop you there. Come on now. I don't know about deep. If anything, let's do Armageddon. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, no, no, deep rising. That's what I meant. Deep rising. Got it. Okay. I, I accept, I accept yeah. that. That's better. <laughs> So um, those type of things where uh, I, I agree we need to be pushing that type of uh, agenda where we're doing more posters because, you know, every every great film deserves a couple great posters. And uh, it's just people being uh, kind of taking that bull by the horns and saying, we're going to go out and, and do this and track down the rights. I mean, a lot of these licensing things that I get in the mail, you'll get a licensing catalog from a company that licenses all these movies. And it's like you say, you look through it and you're saying, okay, Halloween, you know, all these ones are, are ones that we've seen posters for over and over because those are the ones that whoever owns them is like, I'm going to put the net out there and be like, I'll license to anyone that has money. And the people that whoever owns Caddyshack or whatever, they're not necessarily in there. They're not necessarily having to push. And at some point, maybe they'll be like, you know what, there's money to be made here. And then they'll get involved with these licensing companies. And all of a sudden you'll see a bunch of, like Ghostbusters stuff, which I think that was the case a couple years ago, probably now 10 years ago, where all of a sudden Ghostbusters stuff was really popping it up everywhere because they were, realized it was a lot of uh, a lot of money to be made, I guess. You have a lot of posters that have been killed for whatever reason. You know, like you did a lot of work on something and then all of a sudden everyone's like, yeah, we can't do this, you know? So are there a lot of those kinds of rough posters that you have? Yeah. Not a lot, um, but there are a few that kind of made it to a certain phase and then got killed. Um, so it, it goes that way with gig posters. Um, we were doing some stuff for 
Frank Lloyd Wright's, you know, Falling Waterhouse. It was kind of like an architectural print. That one got completely done and it got killed. Um, so I'll just have to turn that into some weird art print or something. But anyway, um, yeah, there's been a few, some Planet of the Apes stuff that got killed um, that we saw later on. Mondo print, printed it kind of in a cool art book of like rejected things. So I wouldn't say there's like 20, but there's probably five to 10 different ones in different phases. You know, even that uh, Fury Road was kind of in that pile for a while because it was half done. And then they were like, stop work on it. We're not in the Roxy's, you know, we're not having screenings right now. And now it's restarting up again. So going back and kind of blowing the dust off all that stuff and seeing, okay, this is where we're at. And hopefully not starting over. We'll see. <laughs> a joke online about your work has been that you've done a Jurassic Park poster. Yeah. Have you ever done a Jurassic Park poster? <laughs> I don't think so. Nowadays, people will show me posters and be like, hey, remember this? And I'm like, I have no recollection of this. So I'm like uh, that Stephen King, only there's no drugs involved. It's just age where you'll be like, I don't remember writing the Tommyknockers. And for me, I don't think there was a, a, a Jurassic Park era where I did that. But I get those emails all the time, especially around April 1st for some reason. Um, so I think people like playing jokes. And, and that has been a dream. And maybe even at some point, with Mondo, there was a couple that was like um, Nightmare Before Christmas. That was a big one where they're like, we have the rights to it, start work on it. And so then you kind of starting to gear up and all of a sudden Disney kind of switched their whole, um, all their rights changed overnight. And then that was one that was killed where they're like, okay, don't work on it anymore. And then people, I think they might've even announced it. Or there was a couple ones that were announced and then they just had to, changed and so then, then people were like it got done but it just wasn't released or it was printed and only a few people have it kind of a thing and so those kind of like urban legend type things grow but yeah. wait so you're, so you're telling me you did a nightmare before christmas poster no i didn't complete it so this was back in the day i, I think if i did it again now i'd have to uh i'd have to start over so we'll see it's really hard to look at something from 10 years ago and be like now i can pick up and start <laughs> you know you'll be like this looks terrible but a lot of my stuff, you know, I mean, if, I, if it's work in progress, I'll probably be like, I have to restart it. But if it's done, so if I'm looking at like a thing poster from way back, I can accept it that it's like, this is the, this is the thing that exists. So I'm not going to be like, I'd really do this differently. I mean, I would tackle it again because it'd be fun. But people would be like, why are you doing this again when you could do any other movie that you've never done? So I probably won't. But <laughs> you know, One of the things about, uh, I think a lot of people don't realize uh, this is, um, your early work, yeah. there's a lot of ink on your early posters and the poster stock itself was very thin. So those older posters become very, I know this from, from the ones I have, they become very wavy. So I think a lot of people don't realize that they, are, they were never meant to last as long as they're lasting. And so can you sort of address that? Like the, post, the, the paper stock in those older ones is not long lasting paper. Right. No, it, this stuff was all done as like, uh, this is for a screening. I mean, just like gig posters, who would think even in 2000, 2005, that you're going to want to have a gig poster from like a Foo Fighters concert um, and for another 30 years. This is something that you're buying at the concert. You're buying this cool thing. You're taking it home. You're tacking it up on your wall with pins. And then you, after 10 years or whatever, you move on. And so we did that with screen printed posters. I really like this super thin newsprint stuff because I like kind of the immediacy of like, this is just printed for this event. It's a cool thing. And it just looked cool to me. But then everyone was like, this paper is so tissue paper thin. Why are you using it? So eventually I had to break away from it. And uh, I really miss that paper. But like you say, I open up my flat files and I'm like, this stuff, uh, it, has a, it has a shelf life. And so then since then, more printers have kind of like, okay, we need to be considering um, the longer lifespan of these. And so I think a lot of paper companies and printers were a little more responsible. I mean, I guess I think it raises the prices, the cost of printing a little bit, but uh, it is worth it just to try to make stuff last a lot more archivally, um, which probably isn't a word. But anyway, um, that's something that we have done and considered. Um, I still have copies of all that old stuff. And if you keep a ton of other posters on it, it doesn't really have waves in it. You just have to put like 50,000 other posters on it. But it is hard because especially when people say, I bought this for a lot of money and then you're signing it and you feel bad at things. You just didn't think about having to make something last for like 30 years. 
And uh, so, yeah, it's something that we've tried to change. And I think hopefully we're doing a better job. <laughs> well, I think with the older posters, once you frame them and they're in like a, a good quality frame and it's airtight, the poster will last much longer, Absolutely. which leads me to, to like, for example, like, uh, you know, one of your older posters, whatever it may be, I know you have them in your flat files. Have you ever thought about putting some of these in frames to sort of help the shelf life or do you feel that like just having a pile of posters on it keeps it sort of safe? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard for me because I don't look at these things. So I would have no problem like taking a thing poster out or a Robocop and putting tacks in it and putting my wall because I'm like, I made the poster so I can, whatever I do to it, that's, that's, that's the person that made it should be able to do whatever they want. I don't really think about it in terms of like, am I adding to the value or it is, it's really difficult for me because I'm like, this is just part of your collection well, of work. I, I actually don't mean adding the value. I mean like preserving it so you still have a copy in 10 years. Yeah, yeah, that's totally a good point. I mean, Sarah kind of said, we can't frame anything more until we have wall space. So um, we just don't have, you know, the, the framing and, you know, we're not, uh, we're very frugal. Uh, I won't say cheap, but we have stuff that we framed like 20 years ago, some of my early gig posters. And those are still hanging up in our house and in our walls here. Um, so it's it's one of those things that we just like, well, I get something more framed with me. I don't have a single movie poster framed, if you can believe it. Um, I have movie posters tacked up all over here, but most of them are done by other people, older stuff. And then my movie stuff, I, I've seen some beautiful frame ups and I'm always like, I need to uh, do a frame up of some of my prints. You know, I, I would love to have the Star Wars series framed and stuff. But I just, you know, time gets away from you. <laughs> no, no, I, I get it. It's also probably different for uh, the person who made it, you yeah. know. Um, so I know I get that. Um, are you a little bit surprised? You recently, um, you recently started doing wood posters uh, or wood. I don't know if the right, if it's not posters, but wood yeah. prints. I don't, I don't know what the right term is. Are you a little bit surprised at the success of these? Or uh, were you sort of like talk a little bit about that? these wood posters i'll hold it up this way <laughs> but anyway um yeah they're just uh something that we got into just because again it's fun you know with a lot of things you kind of feel like if i put out a movie poster and then a movie poster and then a movie poster you're you're falling into uh for me like kind of a, a little bit of a, a groove and you're you're taxing the same people that are like I have to collect every single one of his movie posters, and so then they're spending a lot of money. And I know just from experience on like comics and stuff, you can really be like, man, I spent a lot of money on you know Scud the Disposable Assassin this year. I bought the entire series, and so that really uh, can take a toll on someone um, or just to tax a person, tax an audience. So by switching it to like stickers or band posters or T-shirts or in this case wood prints, you're kind of trying to target a different audience that might be. Oh, I don't collect any of his movie prints, but oh, this is something new. I'll, I'll collect this or I'll buy one of these just because I want to have an art piece in my in my house. And so that was kind of the idea. Plus, for me, you're kind of expanding your skill set of everything is screen printed. So, you know, let's try getting a, a laser and starting to paint wood and, and burn through that and, and have these kind of intricate designs that are kind of burned in with kind of a laser that has a real nice hand done screen printed type of aesthetic. And it doesn't look like it came out of a computer. So. Um, it was all just kind of these, all these different uh, angles that you're like, these are all things that uh, appeal to me is trying something new, learning something new, appealing to a different audience. And then once you get it done, you're like, okay, how much should we be charging for these? Because they take so long to make. You're putting together, you know, this one wood piece, you know, you're sanding all the pieces and then you're painting it and you're lasering it. Um, it's not like screen printed posters, which are historically made because they're cheap to print. So it's just like one color for a thousand pieces of paper. And then you take those back to the printer and you do the next color, a thousand pieces of paper. So they're more of a cheaper medium, whereas these are a little more hand done type things. So it was just a different, it was kind of a pushing yourself fun thing that we could create in house, I guess. Yeah, I'm curious, um, how long does it typically take for you to make one of those wood prints? Probably longer than it should. Um, so let's see here. Let's are you getting are that. you getting faster? I am actually, yeah. You, you just, no, show, uh, show, show, the, show it again. Okay. So you basically have these pieces of wood. You could just do one piece of wood, but I always like the kind of the the shipyard like 
um, different pieces all tacked together. I got a couple of pneumatic, uh, you know, finished nailers and stuff. And uh, so I'm just out there in our barn and just putting these together and sanding them down. I mean, like, this is a lot of fun. Like, I could just be out there just breathing in all this wood dust, shortening my lifespan. <laughs> but um, it's a lot of fun. It's very relaxing. And so you just start banging out all these blanks that you're like, okay, I need it this size. And uh, I really like working with, which a lot of people hate. Some of my friends are like, you cannot work with pallet wood. It's so cheap. But to me, I hate the idea that pallets just get tossed, you know, and it's like wood because, you know, living in the Northwest, I hate seeing trees just get chopped down. And that's our entire industry out here is let's, let's just take down these 150 year old trees. And um, it's just hard to see. So I hate seeing pallets that just get tossed and tossed and tossed. And so it's fun to be able to take cheap wood and then kind of repurpose it and use it, give it a second life that's a little higher I don't know. I don't know if wood considers it's having itself like a, a cast system, you know, a life. <laughs> if it did, they'd be like, I was a pallet and now I'm uh, an art print on someone's wall. So you kind of uh, project onto these inanimate objects and say, I, I, you know, this is a little partnership with me, buddy. <laughs> no, it's actually, it's actually really cool because you are right. Pallet wood is, is an afterthought and you're elevating it to something that people are going to frame and put on their wall. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty fun, and some of it is actually really nice. It's nice hardwood that they want to make sure lasts through this whole shipping process. You just have to make sure you're not using this stuff that has a certain uh, coating on it that it'll actually cause brain damage. So you have to look for it, make sure it's kiln dried, dried, and not like chemically dried. But anyway, they've outlawed those chemicals, so they're very rare. <laughs> uh, completely didn't even think about that. Uh, <laughs> you recently sold a bunch of stickers that come with handbills. Yeah, and I, you you make it so uh, I say this as a fan. Um, it's hard to sometimes get the ones that you want uh, in terms of the hand uh, handbills. So have you and Sarah ever talked about like selling full sets of the pros and cons, or is it sort of like you in, like you want people to sort of have to hunt to get a full set? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really weird. Uh, being in the position I'm in where you, you kind of get a little bit of feedback from uh, people that collect this stuff and then you feel uh, indebted to those people just because they have spent money on your stuff and you feel really grateful for that. And early on in these pros and cons series, I was like, I'm going to sell, you know, I'm just going to give these away with sticker packs to kind of do a cool thing. And then later on, I'll sell some sets. And then people would email me and said, you know, I spent all this money on eBay collecting the set. You know, I'm really happy with it. How do you think that look at the frame up and you start feeling like if I turn around, you know, cause they would spend maybe $300 collecting the whole set. And you're like, I can't really turn around and just sell it for $50 and sell all the prints that it would just make you feel like you're kind of doing that person a disservice. And uh, I remember those emails so clearly and it really kind of then sets something in your mind. You're like, okay, I, I can't sell these as sets now because people are spending money in the aftermarket to collect them. And I would be kind of just, they wouldn't be very, they would kind of feel bad about themselves that they kind of jumped the gun and bought it. And so it just made it like, okay, I guess we'll just have to work around this and uh, make, see if we can make money just doing the sticker packs and never selling them as sets. So. <laughs> No, that, that actually makes um, complete sense. Yeah. Um, and I get that. Um, I still think that you could sell like 10 or 20 sets on, on your site at like a very limited amount um, yeah. and make it, you know, where, you know, you're selling because you make different versions. Yeah. So you could easily do like 10 of the regular, 10 of the alt. And I still think people would be okay with it. Yeah, yeah, probably. Is there anything that you wish people knew about the way you work or the poster like the what goes on behind the scenes that maybe people don't even think to to ask about yeah i wish they knew less actually <laughs> people are like show your process of working show you know all this sort of stuff let's more interviews i'm like no i wish i had no history whatsoever and it was just a blank slate but uh no there are certain things i mean i always appreciate it when people are uh kind in their email. Sometimes we'll get real angry ones. And I'm like, this isn't a, we're not a corporation. We're not a company that we have like a HR or someone fielding them. It's just Sarah and me. And so when we get real nasty emails, then Sarah, she responds to everything other than like uh, personal stuff I try to respond to. But if it's poster like related, that's like, how can I purchase that? Then she responds to it. And if I see one that's pretty nasty, then I just like spam. 
because I'm like, you know, who, who can deal with negative stuff in your life? You kind of just say, we don't have, we don't have the bandwidth for it. So that's something that I, I appreciate that a lot of people do understand is, is that we are just a, a mom and pop shop <laughs> and uh, it's just two of us. And so we don't have like a huge, you know, so you want, you want people to kind of understand that we're just doing this to, to make a living and have fun. And we hope that people are having fun and people are like, I'm really upset about missing that. And I'm like, there's always the next one. And there's always the one after that. It's, you know, and there's the secondary market, which we don't necessarily encourage people to go on. But a lot of times they're like, I can't believe I wasn't able to get this Terminator print. And I'm like, there's a Terminator print on eBay for $65. So it's not like, well, I, I could have made a thousand dollars by that. I'm just like, it's, it's something that you're kind of like, it, it's just perspective. So that's something that you always appreciate. And 99.9% .9 of people are always super awesome. Um, but yeah, other than that, I can't think of anything that I really wish people knew. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> um, do you pay attention to what people are saying on Facebook in your group or in other poster communities, or do you try to avoid? I, I don't try to avoid. I 100% avoid. <laughs> I don't actually have a Facebook account. So I'm like one of those people that's like, I don't have a TV, but I do have a TV. I have several TVs, but um, Facebook, I just never got into it early on. And then I just, uh, Sarah has one. And so she, she kind of keeps me in the loop, but, and I don't read, I have a hard time reading Instagram comments on my stuff because I love reading personal emails. It's awesome. It's always addressed to me, but that whole secondary culture of like um, talking about things, I'm just, I, I appreciate that people have conversations, but it, it's weird. The things that kind of get into your mind and you're like, I really don't want to obsess about this. Like I even have a hard time following other artists on Instagram, like Ken Taylor, who I love. And I'm like, if I follow his stuff, I'm worried that I'm going to be influenced by his stuff and start copying it or, you know, being accused of ripping it off or anything like that. So there's certain people that you're just like, I appreciate them in their own realm and I'm in my own realm and I don't necessarily um, try to reach across. I mean, as a friend, obviously I, I try to reach across, but not necessarily um, following that type of stuff or reading comments or I just figure like, I like the idea of kind of working within a small contained area and, and if you put it out and, uh, and eventually your sales start dropping, then I'll be like, hmm, what's happening here? Maybe I should pay attention. And people, you go back and realize you did something really offensive unintentionally. Um, but until then, uh, I have a lot of friends like that read stuff and they'll kind of say, you know, people are really curious about this. And so people have been really kind about that and uh, letting me know that I need to address certain things that are uh, maybe wild speculation and stuff. So then I'll update my website and stuff. So it's just a balance of not letting people kind of get in your head and make, if everyone's like saying, do this poster, do this poster. And then you're kind of like, you know, you don't want to get, let it influence the direction that you're going to go with your life kind of thing. But I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I completely get that. You oh. recently sold sneakers and socks <laughs> and which, which again is a new direction for you. Was it something that has this been a huge pain in the ass? Or has this been something that you've enjoyed? Is this like the beginning of you selling other socks and other sneakers? Yeah. Well, I appreciate you mentioning that. I think you're the only one that is. Um, it, it was this huge thing that I, I was getting these custom shoes printed by Vans and they were coming from overseas and it was like $100 a pair. And I was just like, oh, these are cool. Like just with custom designs. And then I was like, how much would it make cost to make my own? So I researched it. I found a company that was willing to do it. I got some test samples. I was like, this is awesome. And then I had them printed and I didn't realize how much work goes into this like apparel stuff, especially with shoes where it's like a billion different sizes and styles. And, and then you order those and they're like, no, you have to have X amount per size ordered. And no, you have to have X amount shoes total ordered. So I think I sold like 200 of certain designs and the minimum order was like 600. So I, I took a huge bath on those uh so that's really exciting but anyway sarah was just like usually it works in reverse usually we have money coming in and this time we have a lot of money going out so uh we're gonna have shoes for like for days <laughs> and they haven't even they haven't even arrived yet they're shipping they're gonna be here at the end uh, at the beginning of may and so it was a fun super fun experience and maybe when i get the shoes in here and i'm looking at them and 
able to give them out to all the neighborhood kids and I just see everybody wearing them, I'll be like, this is really worth it. But uh, there's learning. It's just a learning thing with even with shirts. We've done shirts and um, it's really hard to store all of your leftover shirts and you have to do all the sizes. Where with prints, you can store 100 prints or 300 prints in about this much space, you know, on flat file area. And so that was just different things, you know, stickers were kind of branching out and those were a success. And then shoes, I, I feel like we might have seen the last of the shoes. I mean, these will come out and if, if people wear them and they're clamoring for more, but uh, it was a it was a hard thing. And th the next thing I'm looking into is I'm looking into toys and be like, what would this cost? And, you know, seven hundred dollars to make the prototype. And you're like, OK. And, and Sarah's like pointing to the shoe bill and be like, no, look at that. So anyway, I think that once people start getting the shoes yeah. and they um, I think that the, the shoes are something like it's hard to sort of see it. And I, basically what I'm saying is I think that you'll be able to sell the shoes again, especially after people are wearing them yeah. and they might be like, oh, those are cool. Where'd you get them? You know, um, so I wouldn't say, you you know, it's like a long haul in terms of the business. And with toys, you might want to partner with another company uh, than doing it yourself because that's a whole different thing. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope you're right. <laughs> yeah. the shoes. And then with the toys, I'm, I'm sure you're right. It is one of those things that you just have to find the right opportunity. And I have a hard time just with bandwidth. I kind of want to keep everything in house and have, you know, Sarah and the kids working on it. But I do need to partner more with other places and be like, OK, you guys, even with this gray matter thing, they're actually handling uh, uh, the Halloween release. They're shipping 100 percent of the posters, which is a first for me. I've always sold my own copies separately and now they're selling all the copies. And that was just because we came off this Terminator thing. Sarah was working a ton on that. And I thought, well, what can I do to make her life, our lives a little easier? And so we're going to try it. We'll see how it goes. You take a little bit of a, you know, it's more of a partnership. So you're not just like a sole person. Um, but uh, we'll see. It's something that we're trying this new. And I think Michael's a good guy at Gray Matter. That's a great company. So it might be a, a new trend. We'll see. We like having that personal contact with, with people buying from us because you're kind of developing fun relationships. And it's not just this transaction type thing so does that mean you're not going to sell ap's does that mean or that's a down the road kind of a thing it's a down the road thing just because we're i don't even know how many ap's we'll get just because they're doing them all there so if he's selling them i don't feel like they're necessarily ap's because he'll be selling them so i don't even know we're kind of discussing that right now but it will be something if ever it won't be for years i would assume that we would sell any of our copies just because it, that's kind of the, the agreement we reached is that they would handle it. And so it'll be fun. And I think he'll, he'll do a good job and make them available to the same people that I would make them available to. And I hope it's a real positive experience for everybody. <laughs> I, I also think there's a, yeah, after Terminator and all the work, but anyway, I know we're running very long. So I have like a few last things and we'll leave it go. Um, what do I need to do to get you to do a galaxy quest poster? Yeah, let's make it happen. Um, it's just, it's just a matter of uh, having the, uh, you know, all the things lining up, you know, making sure, you know, if they're like Galaxy Quest and we have, you know, Tim Allen and Sigourney Weaver are the rights that we have. And then you're kind of like, can I make a Galaxy Quest poster with just those two people? That's, that's the challenges that you face. And so if somebody comes and says we're doing a promotional screening, we have all these people in attendance, the director's on board, they're going to sign away, I get all the cast to approve this small run. Then I'm like, let's do that. That sounds awesome. So I'm always up for that. It's just a matter of lining it up. So you're doing something because like my time and everybody's time is so limited that you're like, I don't want to do a Galaxy Quest now that's like with two likenesses. And then 10 years from now, someone comes along and says, I have all the likenesses. And you're like, great. Now I have to do it over again and do a better job. So you try to kind of set it up and be like, this is probably the only Halloween poster I'll ever do. I'm not going to come back and be like, now we got the rights to three more people and we can do another one. I'm like, this is probably it. There's so many posters out there. Why do one twice? How much stuff do you have behind the scenes right now that um, you're working on that, you know, for example, like whether it be band posters or art posters or movie posters that you sort of are close to completion on or like that you're working on right now, or is it not that many? Not that many, just because it takes a certain amount of time to do something that you're like, okay, I'm working on it, I'm working on it, I'm done working on it. And then Sarah's like, not Sarah, but 
you know, house bills and stuff necessitate that you're like, okay, now we have to sell this. So we make, you know, it's like your paycheck that you've been working for for three weeks. And so we can't just afford to put it on layaway unless it's something that they're like, hold the brakes on that. So um, usually I put stuff out pretty soon after I get it completed, but there's a few projects that I'm talking with. There's all these galleries that we're talking with um, that we have buddies at that uh, they're saying, let's do this, let's do this. And so you have projects that are kind of in your mind that you're, you know, working on like just mentally and saying, okay, now I have a two week block. I'm going to do this and then we'll get it done. So I would say at any given time, I have five to 10 uh, avenues where people are saying, do this comic book cover, do this thing. And you're just thinking about it and thinking, what would I do? What would I do? But when the actual like pen to paper process comes, then it turns around pretty quickly and then you do it and hopefully it comes out in a relatively reasonable time. Um, you've done a number of Marvel properties, uh, a number of Marvel posters. Do you think that uh, you'll be doing more of those or is it sort of working with Marvel while awesome is just so challenging because of how many back and forth it is? Yeah. I hope to. I hope to do all of them just because I love those movies. My kids love those movies. And so it kind of drives me crazy that I've done like an Iron Man 2 poster and, you know, some of the Avengers post, some of the Captain, you're like, you need to really just the OCD nature of it. You got to have the whole series, you know, it would be like doing a two towers poster and not either other one of the Lord of the Rings stuff. So um, I would love to do them all. It's just a matter of lining it all up and, and being like, okay, let's do this. Let's tackle this. And so there, there are opportunities, I think, on the horizon for that to start happening again where we can do it. It's just been making it line up. And um, so we'll see. That's, that's the hope, though, is that we can definitely, at least for this whole block, rounding it all out. And I don't know if it continues on into uh, Eternals and the, the era that's to come. But at least getting the ones done that have come out so far with such a perfect series, you're like, this would be awesome to tackle any of those. So, I think this is my last thing. Um, uh, I, you know, I love your Shaun of the Dead poster. So I'm wondering what what we need to do to get Hot Fuzz or a Cornetto trilogy poster, you know, um, or at, at World's End. Like, what do we need to do to make these posters happen? Right. Yeah, those are those are awesome. I, I love that whole series. So. I think it's just a matter of those things would be perfect for like screenings. You have a screening at Edgar Wright and then all of a sudden you have him signing off and stuff. And then that would be, that would be amazing. Cause I've heard stories about like Nick Frost is like, Oh, I have the space poster you did hanging in my bathroom. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's a real compliment. So uh, um, it would be awesome to tackle any of those and get that whole thing uh, rounded out. So let's make it happen. 